Think of a blank sheet of paper to represent the world of expanded access. I want you to imagine a big fat line right down the middle of your paper. You've got a left side of the page and a right side of the page. These are the two types of expanded access, and they're very different. On the left side is a classic form I've been talking about. We call it group level or cohort expanded access. Just like a research trial, a group level expanded access trial has one single protocol submitted in one IND. It's generally a multi-site clinical trial because the patients are probably all over the country. It's centrally coordinated with standardized dosing, monitoring, and reporting. These kinds of trials have existed since the 1960s, but they really got visible in the 1980s and 90s during the AIDS crisis. Over 100,000 patients who could not get into research trials were treated with new antiretrovirals, including the first protease inhibitors, through expanded access trials. Similar numbers of patients, those who were not good subjects for cancer research, were treated with breakthrough targeted drugs like Gleevec, Iressa, and Tycurb through expanded access. When we have a class of patients with the same medical condition, we're always talking about cohort expanded access. The other side of the page is for the exceptional cases, patients who don't fit into a definable group. A patient affected by several serious conditions at the same time, or someone with an ultra-rare condition that's outside of the indication the drug is being developed for. One-offs like these are what the individual IND was created for. We also call this single patient expanded access. These are trials of one, so they don't enroll like a big clinical trial. In fact, there's a separate IND for each patient, along with the possibility of a different protocol, different dosing and monitoring plan for each patient. This allows the doctor to describe the individual situation and to customize a treatment plan. The FDA has stated that this may be appropriate for a handful of unusual cases for a particular drug, but it's not the right channel for a patient who's part of a larger class. Unlike a centrally coordinated group access trial, an individual IND can be filed by any doctor. You write the protocol, ask the drug company to provide the drug, and if the drug company says yes, file the IND with the FDA on behalf of your patient. And the FDA almost always says yes, but the drug companies, not so much. The problem is, single patient expanded access has gotten so much media attention, many think this is the only channel. They're unaware of the possibilities of group expanded access. And in cases where a group expanded access program doesn't exist for the drug's use in the particular disease, the single patient request is the only lever a patient can pull. It's right for certain exceptional situations, but very often it's misapplied for medical situations that are shared by hundreds or thousands of other patients, creating ethical dilemmas about who out of the thousands should get early access. In these cases, drug companies typically say no when asked to provide the drug. It's also a huge load on the doctors to write individual case requests for multiple patients. The individual IND wasn't designed for that. We've seen stakeholders on all sides frustrated with the problems of using the single patient access channel for multi-patient situations. And we believe that time would be better spent looking at what it takes to launch well-designed large group access trials that avoid those problems altogether. We'll discuss that in a later workshop. Check back for our advanced expanded access workshops on data collection and biomarker discovery, cost recovery and payers, the old narratives of possible interference these programs have on research, and collaboratively sponsored access programs. Visit our website and YouTube channel for updates, and feel free to contact us if you have any questions.